So hello, Molly, and thank you very much for coming to your admission interview to Clare College to you, the medical course. Um, so I see from your application that you've done some work experience before deciding to do medicine. Could you tell me about that? Right, so the majority of my work experience was volunteering in a care home. So I went about fortnightly for maybe six, seven months and before the COVID outbreak. Um, and like I started off just like following someone round while they went round all the rooms and knocking to visit the residents. Um, but sort of when I sort of settled in more, I spent a lot more time just sat in the common area, like making cups of tea and stuff as well, but just speaking to people whilst like <laughs> whilst I was meant to be on my break, I suppose. Um, uh, and just sat listening to a lot of the patients um, who had dementia, especially, because um, they were really interesting. They had a lot to say, but I don't think any of the other people working there had the time to sit and listen. Were, so there, I really enjoyed were there any pa patients who you particularly remember? So there was a, um, a pair of two women um, uh, and they always argued with each other, but like you could tell they were really close friends. I don't know if they knew each other before the care home or anything. But they always sort of reminded me of me and my friend, the way we argue. Um, and um, they always used to judge the other residents. Um, but I think they were really quite happy, just the two of them. It, um, but between them, they had some really interesting stories as well. And you said that you were doing this at around the time of COVID. Did COVID ha affect the, the care home while you were there? So by the time that, you know, COVID was causing an issue in care homes, it was very much a, if you're not, if your staff is not needed, you're not allowed to come in. Um, and obviously there was so much sort of stress around the time that, you know, I didn't get any real communication during the first, like, few stages of the lockdown until afterwards where I that a lot, quite a lot of the patients had died. I think at almost all the ones that I knew had died of COVID, or they died whilst I hadn't been able to go in. Um, but yeah, it was really, really quite hard not having any news for the first like fortnight or so. And then just these gradual reports of, you know, outbreak in the <laughs> care home and then just hearing which patients had died that day. So a lot of what we do in medicine, we have to deal with some very difficult issues where we care for patients and then we have to actually carry on caring for other patients. How did you manage to deal with that very difficult challenge of you'd been talking with these people week, week after week and, and then they passed away? How did you manage that? I think it was really hard because since like my grandma died when I was younger but like when I was too young to remember so I've not really experienced loss in that way before. Um, I was really quite upset, especially with the first ones, but just like speaking to my parents, who obviously have had more loss in their life than I have, um, just simply because they're older and they've got so much more life experience. That was that was really, you know, that was a really great way to help. Um, and then um, my grandparents are Christian, so they've got lots of ideas about, you know, what happens after death. Um, and I think sort of their views on it really was sort of more uplifting than anything else. Um, I'm not sure like how much of it I believe, but it was just the, the thought that, you know, maybe they are somewhere better than they were, like they're not struggling anymore. Did you, think, did you see any examples of care of these elderly residents that you thought were particularly good? I think m most of the like, younger staff working there, they always tried to like have time for a bit of a conversation, a bit of a chat. Even when there was, they were really, you know, they weren't doing pleasant tasks. They were, you know, changing their um, adult night di diapers and stuff. Like, they always were friendly and lovely to the residents, and I think that was more important than any like medication they'd been given. They were like distributing because just they were all, lots of them didn't have any visitors, and just the fact that someone wanted to talk to them, you was visually like made them so much happier. And when people were listening to them, they found out what wasn't working for them and could change it. And did you see anything that disturbed you that you thought, actually, this isn't an example of care that I'd be really happy with? 
Um, <clears throat> there was one of the older people working in the care home. So like not old, but you know, they'd obviously been working there quite a while. Um, they just, they didn't really have, t- they really didn't have time to like talk to patients and stuff, but they were always short and with them. Um, um, and obviously a lot of these patients, you know, had dementia and they, they were, they didn't purposely do stuff to get on their nerves, the woman's nerves, but she always took it that way. Um, and she just really wasn't good at communicating with the team either. So like she was trying, everything was, she was trying to do it by herself and, you know, she didn't want to talk to patients, she didn't want to talk. And it was just, she was really not very nice to be around. And I can't imagine, you know, if that was the nurse you had when you were in a care home that just her mood would bring you down so much. And then it had belittling you, that would make me feel more miserable than anything else, I think. So what would you what would you take away from that about the way you would want to interact with people? I think I would just always try to be positive and always like talk to a patient how I'd want to be talked to, like not talking down to them, not making them feel like they're an inconvenience. No matter how stressful your day is, you can always find a little way to, you know, make make a joke with a patient or, you know, smile at them. It's that, I think just stuff like that, really little things like add up. Well, thank you so much for talking about that experience that you had. And it was clearly a very, very tough experience um, in a very difficult time with the pandemic. Um, in a care home. I'm just going to change gear a bit now and and we're going to sort of talk about some more um, uh, scientific, if you like, questions for the rest of the interview. And I'm just going to um, share my screen now and I'm just going to show you a few graphs and I'd just like you to talk about them. And um, these are questions where there isn't a sort of straightforward right or an answer. So what I'd like you to do is just share your thoughts and if you can just sort of think out loud um, uh, and and just describe what you're thinking about, that would be really helpful because we just really want to get a sense of, you know, how you think uh, rather than there's a sort of set right or wrong answer for any of these questions. So just share your thoughts and and think out loud and then um, we'll we'll sort of have a conversation about, about what I'm going to show you. Okay, so let's see if we can share this. Okay, so can you see a graph in front of you, Molly? It sort of turned into a, it's cropped itself a bit, and I can only see the uh, (laughs) y-axis. Okay, should we try, I'm just going to try swapping the displays. Yeah, I can see that. You can see that, that's very good. Okay, so can you see, can you see the whole graph now? Yes. So all I'd like you to do is just describe the graph that you can see and tell me about it. So I can tell by the labels that it's looking at the percentage of patients alive after the time of diagnosis, with 100 patients being alive at the time of being diagnosed. Um, And over time, the line shows that more and more patients are no longer alive. So by the time it gets to about maybe just over two and a half, three years, um, almost all the patients are, all, 0% of the patients are still alive. Um, and about 50% are still alive, maybe just over, just under two of the years, years after diagnosis. Okay, so I'll tell you that this is, this is, we don't need to know about what the disease is, but this is, this is all these patients were diagnosed um, at, at, at the start of the graph so they've all been this is this is that they were di- it's the time after diagnosis and um, it's all of them were diagnosed with the same disease so you're quite right about that would you like to speculate anything about what sort of disease this is about the type of illness this is um I think the fact that you know it's such a it's it's so many years short like it's only a couple years when most of all patients diagnosed at the start are no longer alive it's going to be aggressive and maybe even terminal um because it's only there's no information about sort of treatment I'm not 100% sure you know what type of disease it could be but um I would say it's probably something that's like less well understood 
Um, okay, well, we don't, um, we, we, we'll just hold that thought. So, so it's clear that this is a very serious illness, and I think your description of the graph was very accurate. So let's say that this, this line is showing us the black treatment of this illness. And now I'm going to show you another treatment of this illness, and this is the same illness, but now the patients are being given a treatment we'll call the yellow treatment. So would you like to compare with me the yellow treatment with the black treatment and tell me what you think of it? So starting at the time of diagnosis, there's still 100% of people alive, as you'd, you'd hope before you start administering treatment. Um, and then by the time you're getting to about 50% of patients alive, you are quite a lot further in this, quite a, not a bit longer after diagnosis. Um, almost about the same time as when 100% of the patients had died with the black treatment. And then the like sort of longest like time after diagnosis before everyone's died is um, I'd say probably about over four and a half years, uh, which is significantly more than it was with the black treatment. So you talked about the, if you had to come up with one number that would, would come up would summarize the difference what what sort of what sort of number might you use um i probably wouldn't want to use um sort of the time when zero patients were alive because i feel like that's the maximum end of life expectancy for di time after diagnosis with this disease so i'd probably stick to maybe something around 50 percent of the patients live because that'll have less of like outliers yeah. um so I'd go that with the black treatment, it was probably maybe maybe two, um, but yeah. with the yellow treatment, it's probably closer to three, which isn't as much the difference when you compared to when you look at zero percent. Okay, I think that's a very reasonable way way to put it. Okay, so so just very briefly, which which would you prefer to have if you had this illness? <laughs> the yellow one. Okay, that wasn't hard. Okay, right now let's look at another treatment and this is the red treatment. Now would you like to describe to me, let's focus on comparing the yellow treatment because we said that was the best, better of the two that we've looked at so far. Let's compare the red treatment and the yellow treatment and tell me what you think of those. So whereas the yellow treatment, um, there's not that much um, drop in percent of patients alive in the first maybe year or so, it drops really rapidly with red to almost about 50% within, I'd probably say about the first year. Um, but then after that, it the graph changes. Um, and that even as time progresses after the diagnosis, maybe a year after diagnosis, the rate at which the percentage of patients alive is dropping is a lot slower than it is on the yellow graph. So much so that even after five years of diagnosis, there's um, probably around 30, 35% of patients are still alive compared to zero with the yellow treatment. So we talked about using this kind of 50% alive number as a way to compare treatments. Now, if you applied that to the red treatment, how does that stack up? It was not very good at all because it's only reflective of like, a year or like within the short term span of the treatment um whereas this one changes a lot after the first time like the prognosis changes a lot after they survived a year of treatment so so you know if you had to just tell me what the 50 percent survival is then comparing the the red and the yellow treatment just to know yeah, so if i'd say 50 percent survival with the red would be maybe maybe a year maybe a year and a couple of months Right, call it a year, yeah. Call it a year, and then with yellow, I'd probably say it was about three years. Okay, so so on that measure, we're going to throw the red treatment out, aren't we? Because it's clearly terrible if we just look at that number. What would you say the outlook for the red treatment is beyond five years? I think it's a lot better than the yellow one because there's a significant percentage of patients still alive after five years of diagnosis. 
Um, uh, there's obviously still a few percentage drops, but the gradients are a lot less steep um, compared to the yellow one, where after the 50% measure, it continues to um, drop quite rapidly. Well, not rapidly, but as rapidly as it is in the first place. So that... Yeah, if, do, you think, do you think you might have cured some people? Um, I think you might have cured some, but it's hard to tell on the basis that the line is still, um, it's still sloped downwards, it's still negative gradient, and it might just be that it's just really prolonged some people's lifespan. And if, now I haven't told you anything about the disease or the drugs or whatever, but if you had to speculate, what do you think the side effects or the quality of life would be for patients on these two treatments? Um, I think with the red, the fact that it drops so quickly in the start that it might be some of the side effects of the treatment before it starts having an effect. So it could be like really, it could interfere with like the medication and, you know, cause lots of problems. Um, compared to the yellow, which I assume wouldn't have as many side effects because, well, it, might, it would obviously might have side effects, but they might not be as, um, have as much an impact on health. And, but I think that the quality of health after the 50% mark would be a lot better in red than it is in yellow, especially because yellow keep, keeps dropping the curve so that, you know, people are still dying. Whereas red, there's um, not many, as many people dying. I would, I would, I would agree with that. I mean, I haven't, we don't know, do we? I haven't told you. Okay. So this is going to be now the last one. What do you think of that? So, um, I'm not sure what, you know, it means by the fact it stops. Does that, that mean that's that the end of cured? the data, all the data we've <laughs> well, got. It's a brand new treatment and we've only got okay. years of data. I think that it's optimistic, the fact that at the same point that yellow was 50% and red, although it's, you know, stabilising a bit so that it's not as many, there's not very many deaths per year. So, like, um, it's still got a lot more percent of patients alive. But I think it's really important that we see out the five years or so and even longer to compare it to red because it could drop rapidly from the third year mark. Yeah. Okay. So we, we don't really know, do we? Okay. All right. So we've talked through these four different treatments. Now, let's imagine that you're in your clinic and you're seeing a patient who has this disease and your patient is a 30 year old woman with three young children. And she has this disease which is clearly a very horrible disease and she says doctor can you explain to me which of these treatments I should have talk me through the, the you know talk me through these treatment options she says I want to make a decision I want you to advise me so could you sort of role play you know she's not applying for medicine at Clare College um, she's not got lots of very high flying school exams uh, she's not interested in 50% and gradients and rates. She just wants you to talk through the different treatments. So perhaps if you sort of talk through the yellow treatment, the red treatment and the pink treatment to her, could you explain to her in simple language what, what you know about those treatments? Okay, so I'd probably say, you know, to start, um, the yellow treatment, um, I think it like, the maximum sort of life expectancy we're looking at with that would be about five years, but um, it does drop quite rapidly from about the first year mark. Um, whereas with the red treatment, um, the time after diagnosis that we might expect to see um, a life expectancy, you know, we don't, we're not hundred percent sure because it just improves um, the time after diagnosis. So the life expectancy so much. However, with that one, there is the risk that within the first year, the risk of dying on this treatment is really high. So much so that around 50% of patients die. The doctor um, really wants to be fit to look after my young children. Which treatment should I choose? 
I think um, with the yellow treatment, you're more likely to have um, at least two or three years where you are quite well, you're quite fit and quite healthy. Whereas with the red treatment, you might struggle a bit with the first year or so. But after that, you you know, your life expectancy is really quite high and you should be really, really quite well to see your kids grow up. Well, I've heard about this new purple treatment on the internet, Doctor. Can you tell me about that one? Okay, so the purple treatment is looking really good at the moment. Um, we're only a couple of years into starting introducing it, so we really don't know where it's going to go. Even now, about the three-year mark, um, 80, 90% of patients are still alive. It is really looking really good. But my concern with that one is that we don't know where it's going to go from there. Um, we don't know if at four years, all of a sudden it drops off um, and no patients survive that. So I'm really quite cautious about putting you on that one um, until we maybe see what's, what is actually happening with that one. But doctor, I really care about being able to look after my children now. Which one should I go for? Um, I think obviously the purple one looking really good. And if you look at the sort of the first year or so, it's really quite similar to the yellow treatment. Um, so I think that might be the best option. And then I guess within um, maybe a year or two years or so, we might have a much better idea of what the outcome is with the purple treatment. And we can talk about maybe changing to it or if there's other, any other alternatives. Okay, I'll, I'll, spare you, I'll spare you the rest, Molly, but you can see how, how you can, um, how it's quite challenging actually to explain to somebody when you don't have all the information. Now let's switch it back to um, an 85 year old man with no dependents with the same disease what would you advise him to do? I'd probably spend more time focusing on quality of life rather than life expectancy. So I'd probably say that with the red one, um, your quality of life within the sort of first year or so, although it might improve, um, it, you're gonna have really struggle with side effects and symptoms in that time. And there's quite a high risk of dying within that year. Um, but if, if you look at the yellow treatment, Yes, within sort of five years, most patients, almost all, well, all the patients who've had the yellow treatment have died. But within those first sort of two, three years, not very, only a small proportion have. Um, so that gives me hope that within that time, you'll have a much better um, quality of life. Well, thank you very much, Molly. That's a really good um, answer to those questions. Um, and thank you very much for coming to see us. Um, and uh, yes, um, I hope you enjoy your second interview at Clare. <laughs>